Welcome to Bent's Old Fort National Historic Site. Today we are going to get a glimpse of what it was like to celebrate Christmas holiday season here on the southwestern frontier in 1846. Christmas in the early 19th century was not the holiday that we know today. Even in the East, many of the traditions that some of us are familiar with either did not exist or were very limited. For example, there is much debate about the origins of Christmas trees. Although it is generally accepted that they originated in Germany at the end of the Reformation, if not before. They would have been very limited on the, in the United States, being most popular probably among German immigrants. The common image of a Christmas tree with presents underneath originates from an illustration in the Illustrated London News in 1848 of Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and their children around such a tree. It would later be copied by Godey's Ladies Book, which helped spread the tradition throughout the, the United States. They would have been non-existent here, however, on the southwestern border. The Santa Claus we know and love today doesn't originate until 1863, when political cartoonist Thomas Nass drew the version that would be very familiar to us today. You wouldn't have seen stockings hung on any chimney in the fort. Several eyewitness accounts of Christmas on the frontier describe a very raucous occasion with a great deal of liquor being imbibed by the Americans. This is how we believe it was at Bent's, Mr. Bent's trading post. Most of the celebration, though good-natured, would not have been considered family-friendly. Among the Mexican laborers of the fort, you would have found things a bit different. Most of them were devout Catholics, and they would have likely held a much less boisterous celebration than their American counterparts. 1846 had been a year full of dread and excitement for the residents of Mr. Bent's fort. Situated on the international border between the United States and Mexico, it became a strategic location once the two nations went to war that summer. Being the only settlement this far west on the Santa Fe Trail, it was used as a staging ground for the different elements of Kearney's Army of the West as it made its way over the trail. From here, they crossed the Arkansas River, invading what was then Mexico, and drove on to capture Santa Fe. Charles Bent was appointed to be the first American governor in New Mexico territory and began to try and sort through a variety of issues in Santa Fe. Meanwhile, 1846 proved to be one of the busiest years for merchant travel over the trail as they enjoyed the protection of following along with the army. For business at the fort, things slowed as the tribes were weary of coming to a place where there were so many soldiers. As the calendar began to turn to 1847, we invite you all into a glimpse of how the celebrations may have been for the residents here at the fort. Yesterday. Well, th things happen. Things happen. So what's the, what's the news? Well, I just came up from Santa Fe, and I'll have to say things are getting a little interesting there. Uh, I just came over from Mr. Wyme. He sent his regards. He is not joining us for the holidays. He's going to stay with the Cheyenne. Not that we didn't assume that anyway. Uh, but those are letters from Governor Bent and Mr. St. Green. Good. Good. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look at these later. Any other news? Or? That's that's it so far. Uh, war news. Kearney's going to California, which I don't know if you've heard that yet or not. Donovan's going way down south somewhere, so who knows where they'll turn up. Well, maybe you can fill us in later on a little bit more about the news. 
We, we can't, uh, I don't think there's anything in there yeah, that great. has to be kept private. So both of them set up. We just want to read it aloud because I think they've got holiday greetings for everybody in there too. We'll look at these then. All right, well, we'll get unloaded and we brought some robes from Big Timber. So good. We'll get set. Good. Well, I'm glad you made it. I'm glad you made it. I'm glad I made it too. Oh, I don't want to worry because kicking the We'll get unpacked and ready to go. Go ahead, run around. Yes, sir. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. Oh. How was the trip to Big Timbers? Oh, it was good. Um, they're bringing in a lot of robes, and uh, the, the plane's dotted with hides staked out. So it's going to be a good season, I believe. We brought in a wagon load just a little while ago, so... Any news from Gerard? Oh, young Lewis? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a he's a good lad, that guy. Um, he asks a lot of questions, but he's only 17. Sure. That's how you learn. And, and he's a good sport. All right. We were, uh, it was me, young Lewis, and Dave Newell. We were out on the trail, you know, going to the Cheyenne camps, and we were, it was a trail day, so we're riding along talking about a whole lot of things, mostly uh, women and food, things we talk about <laughs> most. And um, so uh, I was saying how, we're talking about the best meat, and Dave said, "Well, most people prefer buffalo." I said, "Yeah, most people do. Some, although some prefer dog." And Young Lewis went, uh, "Dog? People eat dog?" I said, "Oh yeah, some even prefer it to buffalo." And he goes, "Oh, how could they do that? That's so uncivilized." He was just ranting and raving. He was probably thinking about his dog back in Cincinnati or something. <laughs> and uh, so we're riding along, and I said, "Lewis, one of these days, I'm going to get you to eat dog." And he goes, "No way. I'll never be so carnivorous." that I'll eat dog. And he said he'd rather wear his jaw out chewing on tough old mule meat. So anyway, we're riding along. A couple of days later, we're in a Cheyenne camp. We're in the, uh, one of the teepees waiting for the women to finish cooking dinner, smoking our pipes. And then finally, she dishes out this stuff into bowls and passes it out. And Lewis says, what do you got there? And I said, oh, it's turtle. And he goes, oh. So he eats it. He likes it. And then he uh, asks for a second helping. And that's when I say, Lewis. Yeah? How do you like dog? <laughs> <laughs> and he, his face just gets this like, horrible look on his face. He looks down at his bowl. Then he looks up and he says, Well, if it tastes good as turtle, it tastes good as dog. And, and we all have a good laugh about that. So, so uh, he's all right. He's a good boy. What can we get for you? Mm. Well, I need to get some stuff for my uh, Cheyenne family. Uh, with, uh, you know, they know about the white man's giving day coming up. Sure. So I think I'll probably a red blanket um, for the parent. Uh, maybe a piece of red ribbon for uh, my wife. Uh, well, I know you got some summer. You, you can get it later. I'll, I'll be back with this stuff later anyway. All right. And um, what else? I think uh, maybe a, a, one of those smaller copper kettles. And uh, if you could just put that on my account. Sure. I would appreciate that. And uh, before I leave, can you go over and just pop this off in that keg over there? Sure. And I'll be good to go. Uh, this, I've been craving this the last 30 miles. <laughs> so put on his account uh, 10 for the blanket. 10? And four for the kettle. Four for the kettle. Well, like things come dear nowadays, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right, we'll see you guys later. All right. Adios. Thank you for coming. Ah. Well, it's about time to close up shop. Uh, they're going to be serving dinner here soon. So I'm hungry. <laughs> something smells good from the kitchen. Oh, it sure does.
on down, Bob. Mr. Koch, when you're ready. Well, I just saw Mr. William in Big Timbers and he wanted to send along his regards for the holidays. He's going to be staying with his family in the Cheyenne camp, so he will not be joining us, but he sent along his regards. He did not send a letter, but you know Mr. William doesn't like to write letters much anyway. This is from Mr. Char excuse me, this is from Governor Charles Bent. I hope this letter finds you well and in good cheer. Much has obviously occurred since I've taken office being forced to focus almost entirely upon the solemn responsibilities entrusted to me. I am reassured, reassured that the daily operations of Bent St. Vrain and Company are in the able hands of knowledgeable partners and those of you in position to have direct effect on the daily operations of our enterprise. Events here have transpired well. Those in immediate opposition to the new order have fled south from General Kearney's victorious troops. Mr. Vigil, Blair, and Bobien have gone to great lengths to assist me in pacifying those elements in disagreement with us by fair treatment and honesty. Colonel Donovan's well-publicized campaign against the Navajo has shown we plan to protect our new citizens. I'm working to set up a system of primary schools for all here in every town and village. I hope to recruit teachers who are fluent in both English and Spanish languages. Such a measure in view of the fact that a rude and uneducated people are about to become citizens of the United States and to have so large a share in self-government, I consider vitally important to the future prosperity and peace of the territory. I am striving to continue to improve relations between the soldiers, particularly the Missouri Volunteers, and the general population. The arrival of the federal paymaster has resulted in an overindulgence in drinking and gambling within the city. The volunteers have been exceedingly rowdy and when intoxicated, often abusive towards the inhabitants. That combined with the army or one of the summer caravans apparently carrying measles, we know all about that, with it to Santa Fe, causing much loss in life among the children here, has been the cause of a great deal of resentment. I've warned Colonel Donovan and now Colonel Price since the former's departure south. These outrages are becoming so frequent that I apprehend serious consequences must result sooner or later if measures are not taken to prevent them. While there have been rumors of revolt here, I do not put much stock in them having any success. We have a strong garrison here despite the departures of Kearney and Donovan. For those of you that don't know, General Kearney is headed west to California. I believe level heads shall hopefully cool and heed, cool heated tempers. I plan to issue a proclamation soon urging the people to remain quiet in their domestic occupations, that under the protection of the laws they may enjoy the unspeakable blessings offered, and uniting with their government may point out any measures which may tend to the improvement of their country, and thus enjoy individually all the happiness which their best friend wishes them. To all of you up at the fort, I wish a hearty Merry Christmas and Feliz Navidad. May the new year of 1847 bring us happiness and peace. I look forward to seeing you all soon and shall endeavor to journey to the fort in the new year. Affectionately yours, Governor Charles Bent. You would like to hold those, sir? and from Mr. St. Vrain. I hope this finds you all well and in cheer with the upcoming holiday. As you are well aware, this has been one of the busiest years for merchants on the trail. Business has been booming here in the Santa Fe store. I'm enclosing a clipping from a St. Louis paper. I regret I neglected to note which one. It speaks well of our Governor Bent. I believe it may have been written by one of the Missouri Volunteers. Let's see what it says here. The appointment of Mr. Bent as Governor is a most excellent one, and I need not here dwell on the merits of a gentleman who, so is, who is so well and favorably known in St. Louis already. 
I might ask where is a man to be found who would for a moment presume to possess those qualities which are called for in the governor of the territory in the same degree with Mr. Bent, who is certainly the only man whom I have yet seen anywise capable of performing the various and wearisome duties imposed upon the governor of this province. I trust only that the president, in making the appointment herewith, will be guided by the consideration that nothing but a perfect acquaintance with this people, their manners, language, and customs, joined to a high sense of moral integrity and a sound intellect and a spirit of patience and forbearance will qualify any person for the performance of the duties of the governor of this territory. And in proportion as these qualities should adorn the head, the constituent parts thereof should not be wanting therein, either in order to be of essential service and assistance to the governor. Mr. Bent's appointment is a good one. The people here know and like him. They regard him as their friend and esteem him for his moral and mental qualities, and he should therefore be requested to undertake the government of this people unless the time arrives when a better and more talented and a worthier man offers to relieve him. There's the clipping. Speaking of the governor, a letter was recently received by him from a respectable public official in a small town in Ohio about an apparent scandal in the town of Ann Arbor, Michigan. The letter brought with it an unsettling account in regards to someone I believe we just hired as a clerk over the summer. It appears that this gentleman, who is using the alias of Mills, ran up a debt of over $1,000 in a timber business venture in that town. He attempted to recoup his losses in another venture involving land speculation in the Oregon country. Having failed in that venture as well, losing almost another $1,000 of his investors' money, he left in the dead of night for the Mexican settlements in California. Sources at Sutter's Fort stated that he left there rather suddenly after making an agreement to procure supplies in exchange for work. He received the supplies but left before they received the work, making off with two of their horses as well. Sources say he traveled next to Santa Fe. The estimated time of arrival in early July so happens to coincide with the time our own Mr. Mills arrived at the fort. <laughs> All of this would be unsettling enough to any man of honor, however it gets worse. Mr. Mills in his haste to depart Michigan left behind a young teenage wife who is with child and who also must care for their infant twin daughters. She has been forced to subsist in the generosity of family in Ohio who say they do not wish to see that scoundrel from Michigan anytime soon and assure that the scoundrel will not survive the meeting. Governor Bent directs that Mr. Mills be retained at the fort, not as a favor to him, but as a favor to his abandoned family. His wages will be divided among his spouse for the care of his family and those he is in debt to in Michigan and Oregon. That nasty business out of the way, I wish you all a joy au Noel. Sincerely, Sir Ron St. Vrain. Oh, and I believe there's a place in the bastion where we can lock him up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, just uh, in the same manner we locked the rabbit wolf in the bastion, I think it'd be yes, sir. for him. <laughs> All right, ladies, we have, a, we have a lot of food to finish preparing for the first table. I believe we're serving four today. Would you check the ribs in the reflector oven and let's see how they're coming along. These pies are looking good. We have some apple pie coming up. Looks good. They're all Looks good. How is that? Is it getting brown? Yeah, I think it's almost done. I think that one's done. That looks good. So we need to take those out, don't we? Pan of the biscuit Cheetos, the, the cookies. Let's put those on a, on a tin. And we'll serve those at first table as a dessert. Sweet treat. They don't get those very often out here. Gentlemen, uh, have a seat. Um, in the spirit of a season, uh, 
I thought before dinner we would have a slight toast. Yes, sir. I am willing to uh, put this on my account. And you can have a little bit of port to celebrate the season. Thank you, sir. And again, I, Mr. Mills, a little bit of port for you. <laughs> Mr. Duncan, you can be liberal in filling your glass. Yes, sir. I know you enjoy your port. Well, gentlemen, I would like to start off the toast with to the President of these United States, President Polk. As long as we're toasting the President, how about that great American, Mr. Henry Clay of Kentucky? To Mr. Clay. I'd like to bring up, for his efforts, General Carney. Here we go. To the General. Uh, to uh, Major Meriwether Lewis Clark. To the Major. I think we'd be remiss without remembering Colonel Alexander Donovan. To Colonel Donovan. And let us not forget the proprietors of this fort, Mr. Saran St. Brain, Captain William Bent, and Governor Charles Bent. Here, here. <clears throat> no, they're not here to save your situation. You don't have to be that polite. It's not going to help you. And you could be back in the bastion. Worth a shot. And if you're going to sit at head table, I would uh, appreciate both hands on the table and not in your lap. Please. We're going to put in the same bastion as the wolf or the one as the uh, crazy one. Well, I think we're going to put in the same sure bastion as the wolf or the one as the crazy one. Well, I think I think they've shared they've shared the uh, same bastion, the southwest bastion. Um, like yes, please. Uh, small portions. Yeah, I remember Mr. Hatcher coming in and had the rabbit wolf on the end of the yacht. <laughs> and, uh... Okay, yes. And uh, we hauled the wolf and locked it into the bastion. And then two, uh, two winters later, we uh, locked the crazy woman in. She was one of the domestics. Uh, no. Uh, And I'm not too sure which one was worse, the crazy woman or the wolf. All I can think of is that uh, it must have been it must have been a bout of hysteria on her part. Uh, she disrupted the entire operation of the kitchen. The domestics were fearful of their own sanity and, and were hiding their their children from the crazy woman. We couldn't even get the Arapaho to take that. <laughs> what was the name of that young man that he was the only one that could get that wild dog to come off to him? That was Hatcher too. I was believe. that Hatcher too? Uh, I believe so. That's fine. It was either Hatcher or or, or uh, Bob Fisher. 
Yeah, I spoke to Hatcher when he was in the village over there with Gerard, and uh, he was enjoying putting young Mr. Gerard through Western life in a Cheyenne camp. We, uh, we've had some good stalwart men work for the company over the years. I've, I've signed on with uh, Ben St. Rain since 21. And uh, it seems like uh, my whole life has been spent with the company, as with Mr. Duncan. <laughs> it seems like I, I would be remiss, Mr. Duncan, if I, I should have toasted you. Ah, so, here, here. <laughs> Seems like a lifetime. Well, gentlemen, enjoy, enjoy your dinner. Thank you, sir. spirits flowing and uh, buffalo hump ribs and tongues and pretty good looking uh, Arapaho gals was there and uh, I remember there was one Tausania lady she made white bread for us and we had raisins with it there was no butter or milk or nothing but it was a fine time white nice doings yep yep no cornbread white bread with white flour that was good Let's play some more. Sir. As, as would anybody appreciate any reinforcements? Absolutely. I, I would. Is Napoleon French? Thank and you. His compliments of Mr. Pashada. Oh, very nice. I don't know if he knows that, but it is. <laughs> very nice. Great to you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christmas. As it is the Christmas holiday, Mr. Pashada would like to extend the invitation into the billiards room. Oh, oh, nice. Wonder, well, you know, refreshments are ones. provided, sir. <coughs> All right. Very nice. I'll leave everything else and take my pie. <laughs> yeah, I don't need this. You don't need to come for that. Not no. yet, anyway. No. <laughs> I'd like to wish you on behalf of Bed St. Brain a Merry Christmas. And in lieu of that, we have brought you a bucket of Turley's Finest. Uh, Mr. Duncan and I will abstain from Turley's brew because uh, we, we appreciate the enamel on our teeth. Well, we appreciate Turley's brew. <laughs> I, I, knew you would. I knew you would. Uh, Enjoy. I, we will, the company will be giving you a single day off from your labors. Uh, keep in mind that this is a very generous offer, and we appreciate it. And I know that uh, this year has been 
tedious one and one trying on all our patience and our endurance. But uh, not as bad as some in the past. Not as some in the past, which, which brings to mind, not long ago, uh, American Fur Company uh, was celebrating Christmas, and this is a warning to all of you. Uh, the company decided they would let them fire a cannon off for, uh, to celebrate the uh, birthday of baby Jesus. And uh, they loaded up the, uh, the cannon with a shot, a, a measure of powder, and uh, were afraid to uh, put live shot, of course, in it. So while they were out searching for uh, something to shove down the barrel uh, after the powder, uh, they had already been imbibing in Turley's whiskey and uh, decided, uh, one of the trappers decided he would put another charge because the first wasn't enough. And as he went off in search of something else to shove down the barrel, another one of the trappers put another charge, and so on and so on, until there was about four or five charges of powder. This was followed by old moccasins and pieces of blankets and, and horse uh, hair and whatever could be found, and in their cups. And poor old Dave Crow was elected to fire off the cannon, uh, given the honor. And when he touched off the fuse to the cannon, the cannon burst, and it rained poor Dave Crow for almost a whole month. <laughs> the, the, oh, the dogs were uh, fighting over the meat scraps for hours. Oh, the dogs. This is, this is good. good. The dogs. You know, I was at that. That uh, Canon episode in the, the year before, Port Union always has wild Christmases, mainly because they're like a four-day drunk. And uh, in '37, I was with Dave Dave Newell, and uh, we were uh, having a good time, and we heard a loud commotion coming from the other side of the fort. So we ran over there to the tailor's tailor's shop, and because the tailor had killed one of the hunters named Marseille, and um, so we and he jammed him up the chimney. I don't, know, I don't know if he's trying to hide him or what. But anyway, um, we decided that this is a serious thing, and we should probably have a murder trial, you know, against the uh, the tailor. But Dave, in his infinite wisdom, said, "Well, maybe we should wait till the Christmas celebration is over, you know, and, and for a more somber occasion." And uh, so, okay, so we waited a couple of days, and we, we finally decided to have the trial. Then someone wisely mentioned that you know this is the only tailor we have at the fort. <laughs> <laughs> and so they decided to just forget the whole thing. Well, gentlemen, we will leave you to your celebration. Uh, again, I wish you a Merry Christmas, and please, Mr. Koch, do not end up in the chimney. So if we were down in Taos, okay, we would spend the evening at the Midnight Mass. And then after Midnight Mass, the Iglesia, we would come back to our homes and we'd tell stories uh, about like the abuelos. The abuelos are the grandparents. They live up above um, Taos, up in the mountains. And what they do is they come down to the pueblos and they'll look for bad little boys and girls. Uh, and they'll come and grab you and then catch you. By the ears? By the ears, yes they would, yes by the ears. And they'll make, and they'll shake you, and they'll make you say your prayers, or you, or they give, make you give them uh, bizcochitos, right, cookies, right, and then, and then when, when you do that, then they'll let you go, all right, so you got to be careful when you're there in Taos, in Santa Fe. Another thing we would do is we would have a little tradition of the zapatos for the baby Jesus and so we'd have these 
and we put them by the fire and so for for the little baby G's so can you do that Chiquito there you go go and take those and put them up by the by the fireplace yeah oh up higher up above there yep up high on the mantle there you go Chiquito all right yeah. Dropped it on it's all right you're okay see Yeah, very nice. Thank you. All right. Then we'd we would say prayers, and we would pray to hope that this year will be this Christmas will be better. And this year will be more profitable than last year was. All right. So let's say our prayers. Okay, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 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 Very good. Unfortunately, 1847 would bring more turmoil. A revolt in Taos would result in the assassination of Governor Charles Bent. The revolt would be brutally put down by American troops after a series of pitched battles. A questionable trial would result in the executions of a number of those accused of taking part. That summer, William Bent would lose his wife, Owl Woman, in childbirth. A few months later, his brother George would die as well. The buffalo began to de decrease in numbers and disease would run rampant through several of the tribes that were not only customers, but also friends and relatives of the owner and employees of Bent, St. Vrain and Company. All that, however, was unknown and in the future during the holidays in 1846. For a few hours, the occupants of Bent's Fort could forget their troubles and enjoy good food, fellowship, and celebrations. Ideas that are similar to what many of us look forward to during the holidays today. Myself and the staff at Bent's Old Fort National Historic Site wish to thank you for joining us virtually for this holiday season. We hope you enjoyed the festivities and can come by the fort to visit us in person. Happy Holidays!